Hello, my rock world fans. Today we are here with the uh, famous guitar legend Eli Miola. Eli Miola holds uh, one of the most guitar awards of any guitarist in the world from the highest rated guitar poll in the world, the Guitar Player magazine. He has over 20 albums as a leader while collaborating on a dozen or so others with the likes of the Fusion Supergroup Return to Forever. The celebrated acoustic guitar trio featuring Virtus John McLaughlin, Paco de Lucia, and the Ride of Strings trio with bassist Clark and violinist John Long Ponty, and lots of solo albums. So, welcome in Thank Munich. You. Thank you. My home. First question You were born in 1954. Right. And you grew up with Elvis, the Beatles, Ventures, and all that stuff. Right. Who were your heroes that made you start a music career? Well, well, they were some of the heroes. I mean, uh, they they were my my early recollection was watching TV and and, and seeing Elvis on on TV singing and creating uh, the effect that he had made, you know, with the guitar. And so that that's when I was a very young boy. Uh, then the the invasion of the British music became uh, a really big part of uh, what was happening with the Beatles and, you know, at the same time I was listening to instrumental groups like the Ventures and and a lot of those type of surf music type bands. From the guitar know. sound? For the guitar sound, it was wonderful, yeah. So, so uh, I was fortunate to, to have uh, my sister introduce me to a lot of this music. She was seven years older than I mm -hmm. was, so she... She had records coming into the house, little 45s, you know, yeah. RPM uh, vinyl records that she had tons of. So I would, I would hear this music all the time. And I probably got introduced to a lot of it because, yeah. of, because of what she was bringing into the house and friends that came over the house, uh, one of which had a Fender guitar and, uh, and let me just kind of touch it and play it and feel it. And it was, it was like... Uh, love at first touch and that's that's when I you know I had I started to show signs that I wanted to you know take lessons and and, uh, and do it yeah you know. um, so there was a change then but this was afterwards uh, into jazz and fusion who influenced you there and uh, become uh, one of the fusion guitar masters all time well you see it started with me liking like like all the pop, the popular music and the rock music and, yeah. and going into New York City with my friends to the Fillmore East, which I'm very proud to say that I was one of the ones that got to go to it. You know what I mean? You know, you know how legendary that place yeah. was, right? Uh, I, unfortunately, I never got to play at it because it closed in 71. But you saw many events. Yeah, I saw, oh God, it was great. I saw a lot of... Uh, Yeah, I went to a lot of Grateful Dead shows. I went to uh, Jefferson Airplane. I was into the San Francisco sound, too. Yeah. I got to see uh, what I think was the Who's uh, first Tommy performance. Wow. You know, and I got to see them a number of times. Santana. Uh, oh, the list goes on and on and on, actually. Uh, I was at the, the Allman Brothers uh, live at the former East, the actual yeah. show that yeah. became the record. Yeah. Uh, Yeah, it's a very long list of uh, Frank Zappa, you know, who I got to play with later, yeah. in later years, one night. Uh, so, all of that became, uh, you know, the, the influence that carried me to want to, to learn the instrument and, and get good at it. But my teacher, when I was nine years old, uh, at this little music shop, mm -hmm. uh, was an old school jazz player okay so that's how that all happened yeah so at the same time that so I was you, learning you, what you I learned, liked you learned the roots yeah I learned the roots I learned the scales I learned the chords the alternate uh, uh, positions of the chords things and then all the standards as well so he had a beautiful philosophy which is like that that he would teach me that way of playing a guitar involving scales and chords, but he would also bring in maybe some Beatles songs that to him were also beautiful, because they are. 
harmonically. They're, yeah. they're, they work for any person that's uh, associated with jazz yeah. because of the, the beauty and the simplicity of it is, is, uh, is, is part of it. You know, it also had integrity and, uh, you know, all the right stuff, you know, to make it, make it a complete song. Yeah. So I was learning kind of both schools yeah. that converged. And the reason why I was one of the guys that worked well enough for Chick Corea and Return to Forever at the beginning of that whole fusion yeah. explosion. And was it was an explosion because you played in the biggest halls. Yeah, yeah, it was, it was huge. There was three big bands from that, that, that pioneered that new music, which yeah. was Mahavishnu Orchestra yeah. with John McLaughlin, Weather Report with Joe Zowen and yeah. Wayne Shorter, and then Return to Forever with Chick, myself, Stanley, and Lenny White. And, and I think I got it because uh, I was a fairly decent reader. You know, I could read music. I could play in every position. Um, and I played scales. Now, that's, that's something that rock players yeah. don't do. I, I know, yeah. They play pentatonic. Yeah. Pentatonic doesn't require your second finger or your yeah. pinky. Specifically, your pinky. So it's impossible to play, play a scale unless you're u utilizing these fingers. But if you watch rock players, and, and by the way, I tried to, to play in some of those local rock bands, yes, and I was turned down. Because I couldn't play like Hendrix or like Clapton or like yeah. the popular guitarists yeah. at that time where these bands were covering those, yeah. those stylistic kinds of things. But I was a fan of it. And I was really frustrated that whatever the hell I was doing um, was too foreign to them. Mm -hmm. But it wasn't foreign to to the the beginning of that whole fusion yeah. period. What whatever it was that I had was a mixture yeah. of the two worlds yeah. that that wound up being a major plus for me. And uh, is it true that uh, your debut record was in the Carnegie Hall? My my debut with with, with Rachel and yeah with Chick Corea was the first show was at Carnegie Hall when I was nineteen, and I just a few days before I was at Berkeley School of Music. So when I came home, I told my parents I was, I was uh, home from school. And they said, well, what are you doing home from school so soon? And I said, well, I'm playing Carnegie Hall in a few days. This is really and, crazy. And of course, they didn't believe it. I saw Mahavishnu Orchestra 1972 in Circus Kroni in Munich. Ah, yeah. And it was uh, sold out. So there were 3,000 people. Had never been happened before. Well, we got the same. Yeah, I know. At Circus Kroni. You had the same, all the, yeah, yeah. All the, the three few, few That was my first show in always yeah, Circus Kroni. Sold out. Yeah. Which is great because before that, all the jazz fusion bands had small club publicum and then it got... Well, there was, yeah, there wasn't really anything happening with jazz fusion before because Miles Davis kind of kicked it off yeah. by blending rock with jazz and, yeah. and, you know, and that kind of thing. But, Tony but Williams then the maybe. explosion happened with, I would say, John and Mahavishnu. And Chick was really impressed with that, that sound of electric guitar mm -hmm. with sophisticated composition. So I was at the right place at the right time. And, and then I had to, you know, once the ball was passed to me, I had to really kind of come up with the goods. And, yeah. that, and that's what led me to, you know, develop my skills as a writer. Because, yeah. because really, there's plenty of great players. And today, there's more, more great players than ever before. You're right. But but it was the I think the writing that uh, that helps define who you are and, and creates longevity in the business. Why did Return to Forever split? You mean recently split? Uh, they they split uh, nineteen seventy. Oh, well, that, it's it's kind of a heavy subject, somewhat involving Scientology. Okay. You know, Chick's a staunch Scientologist. Okay. Uh, he also wanted um, his now wife, who I guess was his girlfriend then, to, to all of a sudden join the band, kind of, you know, Voodoo there's game. a famous Beatle that had a similar situation. I know. <laughs> okay. <laughs> you know, and, and, and then he wanted to like add horns and have her as the, the lead singer. And the whole image of Return to Fervor was this, rock, jazz, yeah, yeah. electric and the guitar in the front kind of image. 
And he just wanted to, right after we signed a major CBS Records yeah. contract, it was an unbelievable contract, he wanted to change course after signing this big deal. And so uh, Lenny and I were really against it. <laughs> And he, he then decided to to hand the contract back to CBS That's a to actually give it back and say, you know, I'm sorry, but, you know, I can't I can't do this anymore. And the record company went crazy and compromised by allowing him to do what he wants to do. Yeah. But Lenny and I were out at that point. At which point I then sued. I know, because after that there was a live album and there was yeah. different players. But I sued, actually. And, okay. And, and really, my, my reasoning for suing was really interesting. My, my name was on the contract. Mm -hmm. So was Lenny's. But he wanted to take the whole contract, mm -hmm. which he was not allowed to do. So I could either go on through life feeling really mad... Or I had a better chance of having him realize that what he did was 100% wrong. I think you did the right I did. Decision. We yeah. got paid. Yeah. And then two years later, he came around and apologized. Which is okay. Which is, which is okay. You know, unfortunately, that same thing happened again on the last reunion. This is uh, what would be the next question. Then there was... The yeah, same exact thing was, happened on the, uh, on the last reunion. a big reunion, reunion and yeah. there were great concerts. It was a reunion because of me. Because of uh, uh, a German uh, promoter and a very rich Russian investor wanted mm -hmm. to put up a very huge sum of money to see that band happen again. Okay. It was a great deal. And for some reason they came to me because I think I knew one of them. In fact, you know one of them. We were talking about him okay. before. And it was a real deal. I said, but I can't go to them because if I go to them, they're going to think that I'm in on something that they don't know about. So I... I recommended to them that they send an email of whatever they want to propose to all of us at the same time that we all see it. <laughs> Strategically. <laughs> it was brilliant because, because I, I thought that even if Chick turns it down, and the reason why he hadn't been playing when we turned it forever was mostly because Stanley Clark left Scientology. Yeah. That was a biggie. Yeah. Okay. So they weren't talking for a very long time, maybe more than two decades. You know, so even though the issue of the band getting back together came up. So anyway, I figured in my mind that in the worst case, he turns it down, but yeah. it'll get him to start thinking seriously about Return to Forever because he knows the three of us saw a great deal. Yeah. And it worked. Unfortunately, he didn't go for the deal because what he wanted to do was totally control it. Okay. Totally have his Scientology team control it. Uh, use his own uh, booking agent, his own lawyer. I was, I was on one of the reunion concerts and it was brilliant because the band was really brilliant. The arrangements were brilliant and it was... Uh, Where did we play here? I don't even remember. Not in, not in, not in Munich. Oh. Um, and then I saw the band also some a year later or two with... Not with you. It was with Gail? No, it was with Jean-Long Ponty. Oh, oh, that was after the reunion, the yeah. recent reunion. So why did the reunion came and then you went out? Because, because um, the honest truth is, and I don't care to say it, but, you know, he uh, got greedy. Mm -hmm. He got very, very greedy and uh, basically kept all of the money of the live CDs and the DVD. And offered Stanley and Lenny a, a jazz trio tour. Understand. Okay. The problem with that was, um, which was absolutely idiotic of him, because it took a lot to get this kind of supergroup back really? together. <clears throat> But he wanted. He didn't. I don't know what it was with him, and but he he felt like it was his group. Okay. And yeah, it was his group, but. So the Beatles was, was John's group, you know. That doesn't mean that if the Beatles were to ever come back together, if they were all alive, right. that John could take the lion's share and, and then do, 
you know, do disrespectful things to the other members, and that's what he did. Okay. Plain and simple. Let's leave Return to Forever. Let's uh, go to one of the best-selling live records, over two million uh, sold records, which is unbelievable. Friday Nights in San Francisco is the acoustic guitar trio featuring fellow features John McLaughlin, Paco de Lucia, and you. Please tell us something about, you know, or tell us some memories about the time and the recording of the live album. Oh, it was great. We, we began our tour in Germany, and I think most of our shows were in Germany. So it was a two-month tour. We played almost every night. And from the beginning, I, I had a sense that this was going to be, you know, great and, and historic in a way. And so we, It was historic, definitely. We, yeah, well, bigger than even I thought, because that record sold, I think it's in excess of four million now. Wow. It's just, and it's still selling even in this weird CD market time. But we did, oh God, we, over two to three weeks worth of shows, I think, in Germany. We recorded everything. And, and then we went to other countries, of course. Uh, then went to the States. The States, we only did, I think, New York and, and L.A. and San Francisco. And maybe Chicago. I don't, I don't remember that far back exactly where. So, <coughs> it was the last two shows of that two months. Ah, oh, okay. That we re we also recorded. So, I in fact I have all of the two inch real analog tapes of yeah. all the shows. They didn't know what to do with them, so I said I'll take them. You know, so I have Friday night and sa Saturday night in San Francisco. And now uh, you tell us that Saturday night is better. No, I, 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 I don't say it's better. I just say it's, it's good enough for another record. Yeah, why But not? John didn't yeah. want it to come out. Okay. You know, so you, you have to get the approval of... Of our... You know, I mean, I can ask Paco and, you know, but I have to go through the church. Under the sunstone. Something like that. <laughs> Paco would have been fine with it, I'm sure, but, but John is uh, not easy to deal with. And... Unfortunately, because it was at a time when we were offered a whole lot of money for it to come out, and uh, and also the uh, I have the the video of it as well. It could have been a great DVD. Wow! That he didn't want it to come out. Maybe someday it will come out. Wow! Then there were a lot of things between. We cut not. We we cannot uh, go into everything. But let's go to the last album, the last really great album. Um, All Your Lies, which is a tribute, your tribute to the Beatles, and was recorded at the famous Abbey Road Studios. Yeah. Tell us something about the record and the making of it. And, well, uh, it, was, uh, it was a couple of years ago when, when I was on tour, it was in the month of May, uh, that I uh, was in, I found myself in a hotel room in Prague, and I had many days off within the tour, And since I have a European band, they would go home on the on the off days. <clears throat> Excuse me. And um, I just found myself sitting in this room, uh, trying to think what to do to utilize my time. And um, I had the concept of doing something with the Beatles for a few years or more. You know, actually many many years was just an idea. And then. I started playing with some of the pieces to see what, how I can add my own rhythmic, syncopated style into what they do, with all due respect of the, of the composition. So um, I thought of uh, maybe looking up a studio in the Prague area, because that's where I was, or in Germany, where I know there's many studios. And then it was the most bizarre thing. I, I, I just never had even dreamed of Abbey Road. And it just came to my mind, Abbey Road? I don't even know if that's operating anymore. So what I did was I called a friend in London who's a fellow guitarist, a friend of mine that I've known for many years. And I asked him if he knew about it. And he, he said, actually, I don't really know if it's operating, but I'll find out. I thought it was just a tourist site. So he calls me back and says, it's out. It's fully operational. Cool. All three rooms are intact as it was and when the Beatles were there. Big rooms. Yeah. The, big, the Studio One is the big, big room where they did a lot of the orchestral yeah. stuff. Two is where they did the majority of their records. And then three is where Pink Floyd, yeah. 
the Dark Side of the Moon and, and George Harrison yeah. did a lot. And the Beatles do some, some things there too. So he, he wound up uh, securing a day for me because there were, most of the time had been booked. Since that next week, I was going to London anyway mm -hmm. to do some shows there. So we wound up, I said, all right, take the day. And then one day opened up into three days, and that's what began the record. And the whole experience was complete magic. It was total inspiration. The sound was the best I'd ever heard in my life. Yeah. The thrill was a thrill I hadn't felt since I was a young child, maybe going this to... This is cool. Disney World. Yeah. You know? it, and I haven't felt that feeling. Yeah. You know, as an adult, you, you know, you, we don't get so impressed like that, right. like we did when we yeah. saw our first rock show, yeah. you know, or something yeah. like that. It was that kind of it was first show. That maybe <laughs> times five, you know. I yeah. mean, everything in there was smelled of the Beatles, you know. And and so it, it became very inspirational. Uh, The sound in the headphones was perfect. I wanted to record every aspect of the record just like they do, or did, yeah. which was which was analog, a track, and just to prove my point, uh, because I always liked the sound of the Beatles records. Yeah. Everything was in your face yeah. and uh, big. You're, that, you're right. Uh, I wanted to do it both ways, so we did we did an A B comparison from Pro Tools against the a track cool. analog. Yeah. And the difference was humongous. And it, you, you, you choose the eight trick. Yeah, because the difference was so much greater. Well, analog. Although engineers hate that idea, they like working with Pro Tools. Yeah, it's harder to, to work. Yeah. yeah, But it was only well, it was primary solo or you know a couple of overdubs. So it wasn't it wasn't as if we needed to have you know 32 tracks. So. You, you recorded 32 tracks. No, no. no. We, we didn't need 32 tracks, we, you know, because it was just, uh, it was just me, really. Yeah. It wasn't a whole band, yeah. so there, was, there wasn't a necessity uh, to make a big production record, nor yeah. was there a budget. So I, I had to work these compositions very much in a, in a solo stylistic way, you know. Yeah. Which, which would really make it very different than... The Beatles, which is what I want to do anyway. When I heard the, the record first, uh, I thought, uh, this is very hard because there are a lot of tribute Beatles CDs. Yeah. And, and all the people say, don't touch Led Zeppelin, don't touch the Beatles. Right. But this record is really very different because yeah. it brings complete new aspects to the compositions. Yeah. And you realize the Beatles music, for sure, But it is uh, it is an open uh, it is open minded and, and yeah. it is a complete new world. So it's uh, I think it's a I had really that same a great from a, great, a lot of a lot great. of people had that same view that there's there's hundreds of tribute bands yeah. that or artists that have done the Beatles and how many songs you re you recorded and at the end you choose the. 11 or how much or around the album. well I, I chose songs that harmonically were interesting enough for me to do what I needed to do rhythmically in yeah. the picking sense uh, because some work better than others like if I had done a song like Come Together Come Together is not harmonically interesting okay what makes it interesting are the words and the sound effects and things yeah. like that so there's not mm, a whole lot you can do compared yeah. to a song like Michelle or Penny Lane yeah. or I Am the Walrus or Strawberry Fields, which have a, a lot of harmonic movement in a beautiful way, actually. Yeah, I think so. You know, I'm known for complex music, but, but some of the most beautiful music is, is far simpler. Yeah. You know, and they had an aesthetic to their music. I mean, a lot of pop music is simple. It doesn't make it aesthetic. So a lot of it was not so great. But they had an aesthetic in, in, for me, almost all of what they did. Maybe with the help of George Martin. I, I, I think George Martin and is 50% of the process. It could be. And then uh, you have the, the, the healthy, what I call, yeah. healthy competition yeah. between John and Paul in a writing sense. They were competing too, but yeah. health, in a great way. Yeah. So you had that, that melding of two super geniuses, yeah. you know. 
you know, that's the way it was also in the beginning with the guitar trio. We, we, it was a healthy competition. It didn't, whine, it didn't end in a healthy competition, but in the beginning, that's what the audience is like. They like to see us dueling, playing like one guy takes a solo and the next guy has yeah. to outdo it. But yeah. we, it was very musical. Yeah. We were having fun, and that's, and that's what was successful about that. Same with the Beatles. Um, are there any plans to record maybe a live album of the tour, of the current tour, or do another studio album in 2015? Well, I'm, I'm in the middle of a, a new studio album oh. of originals now. In what kind of... Uh... What kind? Oh, man. It's like um, 2015 fusion, primarily. So you play electric guitar again? Yeah. Les Paul through Marshall. It's, it's kind of like... I'm coming full circle back to the sound that I that I became known for, uh, but with compositions that have evolved to this point. Cool, and also acoustic. But but the but the electric yeah. is is taking a a more f focal yeah front. This is good news. On the, yeah, I mean it's I never thought I would do it again to this degree. But a personal question: You have a very nice and beautiful German girlfriend changed your life to live with her in Munich, as you told me. Tell us about your side of the view about love. Well, we all, we all search for that. It's, it's a never-ending search. And, and, you know, surprisingly, I always thought, this is the part she didn't want to leave. <laughs> What bad timing. <laughs> oh, man. <laughs> you can stay. Yeah. He knows how to get here. I, you know, I, I always, I always had an affinity uh, for German, uh, for Germany, and I always had this vision. I'm going to wind up in Munich. Really. And and my only fear was winding up here alone. Yeah. And when we met, um, and Stephanie is. Uh, She's an accomplished journalist with Donna Magazine, and we met at uh, a big rock event in Budapest. Yeah, and it's been, it's been the most intense love of my life, and it's, it's just the most amazing, great, great relationship I've ever had. It's, it's almost two years now. And who can say that? No, hard, we we talk about it all the time. Not many people could say that, but it's just so great. Perfect. Yeah, go. You know, I can't. Uh, I thank Germany. I guess. Who do I thank? <laughs> parents. You know. But she's so unlike an American girl. Thank God. <laughs> Good. <laughs> um, Alice, is there anything you haven't done yet musically, and you think one day I really love to do that? Yeah. Uh. Yeah, it would be it would be kind of a dream if Paul McCartney did actually hear my record and then say to me, "I'd love to do something either with you or could you contribute to something of mine." That that would be pretty amazing. Sounds that amazing. would that would that would bring me back to being a little boy. Cool, crying. that's cool. Just um, please tell us if you want a secret about. Oh, by the way, I talked to Pete Townsend the other day. Really. Yeah. And he wants to do it. <laughs> well, we, I think we've become kind of friends because of our, the affliction that we share with the tinnitus ringing of the ears from okay. years of playing extremely loud music. So one out of 20, maybe 20 guys will be losing their hearing, but maybe one out of the 20 will not only have the hearing loss, but also ringing. Because it's a genetic yeah. uh, thing that turns on. So yeah. we, we, we got it to, uh, when we played London last week, we, yeah. we were on the phone uh, ah, cool. and Isn't then nice. exchanging emails. And it was very nice because I was such a big Who fan. You know. I, I, uh, if I can say that, I, I bought a ticket to Manchester and have to go there in December because this is the last tour in England. Mm -hmm. And I, I, I will go there and <laughs> we'll watch The Who again. Because this was one of my fa first. So he's concerts. playing again, right? He's playing again, and then they do a America tour next year. All right. So you know he has to be very careful. You know, 
right? So it's like me when I, when I do this electric thing. Yeah, I have to be very careful. So he's in the same boat. Tell us a secret about Elde Müller that nobody knows. Well, I started out as a woman, and then I uh, got the change done, but no one really knew that. But scratch that part, I was only kidding. Um, <laughs> Stephanie's having a heart attack. <laughs> she is shocked completely. <laughs> but I love this kind of answers. <laughs> um, at least, some words to your fans, please. Tell them what. What do you want? What you want to say to them? I want to say that uh, I I really have appreciated them following my music over the years. I have a lot more to say, a lot more to do, and I and I just keep coming back to Germany, who's been the most receptive country in the whole world. And as a result, I'm here uh, now, and uh, keep an eye out for the new return to the electric guitar record that I'm halfway finished with now. This is great so, news. So 2015 will be a record probably in the spring. Great. Yeah. Thank you, Al, for My the pleasure. interview. Thank My you. Pleasure. I think he's got his stuff with him. Oh, and he can't handle the doors.